I mean, it's finally nice outside. <laughs> the snow went away. Maybe. <laughs> so, last weekend, we had house church at our place on the deck after a barbecue, if you can believe it. And I love that house church group. And actually, one of the highlights for me is Isaiah Maga, who was told he was getting a story told him about today and showed up, which I appreciate. All right? 14 years old, right? Grade 8. And he... What? You're grade 9? Actually? My kid's 14. I figured same age, same grade. Okay, grade 9. That explains it. Because he's the only guy, only kid in our group who sits with the adults and talks. Actually, he talks more than some of the adults. And I'm not kidding you. I really appreciate what Isaiah brings to the table. I appreciate your participation. Know that. I'm not joking. Um, This past week, we were talking a little bit about what people think about Christians. And Isaiah made a comment that a lot of people make assumptions about Christians. How do you feel about assumptions? Raise your hand if you love it if an assumption has been made about you. (laughs) Thank you, mighty warrior. I appreciate that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it depends on what you're assuming, right? But lots of times when you make an assumption about somebody, it's not a great one. And there's a famous quote about assumptions, which I can't tell you, but I believe it to be true. Assumptions aren't great. They make the person making the assumption and the person who the assumption is made about look foolish. Let's just say it like that. They look pretty foolish. There's a lot of assumptions out there that are pretty stereotypical and pretty silly. For example, all farmers are wealthy. All right? (laughs) Pastors only work one day a week. (laughs) Serious. And all lawyers are liars. (laughs) And then there's the one Isaiah reminded me about, which is currently in MUCC. And that is that if you're a Christian, you hate gay people. Just like all the assumptions on that list, they're not true, and they make the person assuming it and the person they assume it about look stupid. But the reason that all of these assumptions and generalizations have some credit is because there's been wealthy farmers, lazy pastors, lying lawyers, and hateful Christians. Right? Absolutely right. And we need to work hard at changing those perceptions and correcting those assumptions about Christians. It's a horrible one. And we need to fight it. And after Isaiah told me that, I thought about other assumptions that people made about my faith when I was a kid growing up in high school. And I was a pastor's kid, and people knew I was a pastor's kid. So they often would ask me, hey, is this true about Christianity? Is that true about Christianity? And I would go into it because I was a pastor's kid, and I I knew a lot of stuff. And one of the things that came out all the time was after we talk about it, I say, like, you ever think about being a Christian? And they're like, most of them were like, no. Why not? Because you don't get to do anything. Like, what do you mean? Well, if you're a Christian, that means you can't fill in the blank. You ever heard this before? Never run into this? If you're a Christian, then you can't drink. You can't smoke. You can't have sex before marriage. You can't swear. You can't watch R-rated movies. You can't fight with other people. You can't even hit back if you get punched. Can't, can't, can't. All rules and all negative rules. And they're super turn off for people. And it's a temptation for Christian kids. Man, if I can't do all these things, it must mean they're fun because my face is boring. These are all these assumptions that get made about Christianity. And they're all negative, and they all make the people who make the assumption and the people they make the assumption about look foolish. They actually paint our God into a policeman in the sky who doesn't want anyone to have fun. There's one having fun. Ha! I got him. Like a mosquito on your arm or something. And it it makes our faith so one-dimensional. Jesus did not come to give us a flat, boring, one-dimensional life. He came to give us life to the full. And, And it's all about, Christianity is all about the stuff you can do, not about all the things you can't. 
And Pastor Joe basically preached my message, which is great. I appreciate that because we need this one hit into our heads a few times. Okay? So before we were saved, we actually looked at God and his goodness and we said, that's bad and that's boring. We were completely blind, deaf, and dumb to the new life that Jesus gave to us. And honestly, guys, anyone can do evil. That's your default setting. You're really good at it. No offense. Humans are really good at doing the wrong thing first. But it takes a saved person to be able to choose and do right for the right reasons. That is what Jesus did when he came and died for us on the cross. He changed us fundamentally from being evil as a default setting to being able to see and choose the good. And actually, not only do evil people kind of poo-poo Christianity because it's no fun, there are actually a lot of immature Christians out there who kind of go, well, I don't know, this Christian thing is okay, but... It's not that great. I mean, it's kind of boring. You have to go and sit in a building for at least an hour and a half, if we're lucky these days, on Sunday. And then there's house church expectations. You got to do this, you got to do that, and you can't do this, that, and the other thing. And man, I just wouldn't mind if it didn't feel like so much work sometimes. And you know what? I struggle with that too. Honestly, I do. Because sometimes I wish it didn't feel like work to be a Christian. Sometimes I wished it would just flow out of me really easily and there'd be no problem in loving others as myself and forgiving as Jesus forgave me and being patient and kind and humble and merciful and all these other things. And you know what? Why don't I get good results from this? After all, the pastor keeps telling me I have the Holy Spirit, which is God himself inside of me. So I have this amazing power that lives inside of me and yet see no difference in my life. Is it even real? Like, why, why isn't stuff happening to me? Why, isn't, why aren't there more results? Why don't I feel it a lot more? I absolutely know where you're coming from if you've had that thought or struggle with that from time to time. This life that God freed us up to live is good and hard. And there's a substantial amount of discipline that's required. And there's a ton of unlearning. So it's not just learning, it's unlearning all the things and the habits that we've kind of collected and then starting to apply what we've worked at. But as we do it, we enjoy it. As you do more of it, it you get a better taste in your mouth. As you go and make progress, you will grow in your holiness. You will grow in your faith as a child. <laughs> Actually, as a faith as a child of God. And then I started thinking about clothing and children. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid and I went to church, my parents made me dress up. Anyone? Did your parents make you dress up when you went to church? Not as many as I thought, or you guys just don't want to admit it. I appreciate you boys right there with the big hands. I like that. I hated dressing up. Clearly, I have some childhood issues, right? Right? I hated dressing up. My parents always managed to find the scratchiest, warmest wool sweater to wear. And I didn't want to be hotter, so I wouldn't wear a t-shirt underneath this sweater. So it was like this horse hide on me, scratch. And it just, you know, and, and eventually the product of that is the kid who sits in the front totally slouched like this because he wants to tell his parents how much their outfit is terrible. I don't care how good you look in it, son. It's terrible. I don't like this. I don't want to wear it. This, and get this, guys, here's the parallel. This outfit you bought for me, it's a burden. I hate it. I don't like it. I'll put it on because I have to. And I wonder how many times we think about our Christian life that way. It's a burden. Oh, it's scratchy. It's itchy. It's a good thing I only have to be this for an hour and a half a week. You know, like, it can get like that. I'm not saying it's like that, but it can get like that potentially in your life. But the thing is that Jesus has changed your life and freed you from slavery. It was a good choice, Victoria. And he's given you this brand new set of beautiful clothes to wear that actually suit you. But in order to wear those things, you have to take off the old dirty ones and put on the new beautiful ones that Jesus bought for you. 
That's the focus of our passage this morning. So if you take your Bible and turn to Colossians 3, then we're going to walk through the passage that Claire read and also some of the context to that as well. Colossians chapter 3. We're actually going to start in verse 1. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the reality of heaven, where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. So just by way of review, this is who you are now. We have been chosen, we have been saved, and our lives are hidden with Christ in God, secure. You're on Team Jesus now. Team Jesus has a uniform, like Pastor Joe pointed out to us. And it's a beautiful set of clothes that Jesus has bought for us. But first, before you put those on, you've got to take the old stained stuff off. All right, you've got to get rid of it. You can't bring both. You've got nothing that nothing comes with you from this life. Everything has to be taken off and the new stuff has to be put on. The brand new you, the cleansed from sin you that Jesus saved, he has provided so much for you. Jesus literally says here that we need to put on the new nature. All right, so take a look at verse five. Here's all of the old greasy clothes you had to take off. Put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of the world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you've stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Okay? So, stripped off. Right? You should be glad that I've just got a tank top and shorts on. (laughs) Right? But that's it. That's the metaphor, is that you are completely cleaned off. That God has taken everything that was sinful and gross about you and deleted it. And he's going to rebuild you with a bunch of new things, a bunch of new clothes. Your old sinful stuff, gone. Your new stuff is about to come. Look at verse 10. Put on the new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Nothing in this new life matters except for Jesus. Who he is and what he's done for you and the new outfit that he's provided for you, which we're going to read about right now. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. So in those three short verses, Jesus outlines eight different items that we're going to focus on today. And today, instead of thinking of all the things that we can't do as Christians and we can't be as believers, we need to correct the misperception about how limiting Christianity is and open your, my, anyone else's eyes to the free and great that the the Lord has given to us. So let's just go through this passage one at a time. The first thing that the Spirit tells us to put on is tender-hearted mercy. All right, tender-hearted mercy is not really an item that we talk much about, but we would say that that is compassion. We read about compassion in Jesus quite a bit, right? We like when he's walking through the fields or he's meeting crowds. I really didn't practice putting socks on and preaching at the same time, so this is a new experience for me. But compassion is when you feel something for someone in your heart. You feel the love that you have for that person wells up inside of you 
you, not pity, it's not pity, it's something deeper than that. It's a desire to see their good. It's a wish that they were in a better spot. So when Jesus looked at all the people and he saw these sinful, hurting people, his heart was tender towards them, not hard, right? So sometimes we can run into somebody and we can see where they're at and what they're doing and we have a hard heart towards them. And we say, you made your bed, you sleep in it. Jesus is not that way. Jesus sees all of us in our terribly messy beds and his heart is tender towards us. And that's the first item of clothing that, he, that Paul tells us about here. Because we're on team Jesus now, our hearts can and must feel tender towards people who are stuck in sin and suffering and hurting because of the choices that they've made. It's not up to us to judge those people. That's up to God. Our job is to show love to those people exactly the way that Jesus did. doesn't mean that we don't tell them the truth, because Jesus was full of grace and truth. He told people the truth about their sin, but he did it in such a loving way. He was gracious and he was truthful. We need to be that way. So put that item on. Compassion. Tender-hearted mercy. Allow your heart to be soft towards the marginalized, towards the destitute, and even towards those who abuse grace. Because even as Christians, we have abused the grace of God from time to time. There has probably been a time in most of your lives where, as a Christian, you said, you know what? God will forgive me. And you go ahead and do the thing that you knew that you shouldn't do. So you need to have tender hearts towards those people. And that tenderheartedness flows right in to the next item, which is kindness. Right? Now, it's, it's kind of like what James said. James said, do not merely be hearers of the word, but be doers. Right? So you, have, you can't just listen to the word and not do what it says. You have to do what it says. This suit has not been on. In a little while. <laughs> there we go. Well, when we talk about doing things, you talk about putting on your pants, right? All right, if you're terribly offended by this sermon, please do come talk to me later. But I think it works. Putting stuff on. God gave us this beautiful suit of clothes. We're putting it on. All right, so when we talk about putting on pants, we're talking about getting to work right? In fact, you might have said that to your kids at some point. It's time to put on your big boy pants and get to work. And that's what we're doing. So Jesus not only gives us the ability to feel compassion in our hearts, he gives us the ability to do something about it. Kindness is the expression, the action of compassion. Jesus felt compassion for the 5,000. So what did he do? He fed them. Jesus felt compassion for the leper and the blind and so he healed them. It was one thing flowing into the other. Jesus was always doing amazingly kind and good things for his followers and for random people, seemingly. He is our good God. He feels compassion, and it comes out in kindness. So put that item on. Jesus has freed your heart from sin, and now, he can fe now you can feel the way he does about the human race. If you, you have a heart of, you used to have a heart of stone, now you have a heart of flesh, not, not a heart of stone, and we need to act from the compassion that we feel. If we feel compassion and do nothing, it won't be long before we actually end up looking down on people and we say, oh, those poor people, who's going to help them? Not me. And you walk away. You don't want the compassion in your heart to be calloused over by inaction. You must act. If you feel compassion, we need to act. We read in Sunday school today and in this past week, if you're following our church Bible reading plan, Hebrews 6, 1 to 2 basically says, you got to get off the couch. You got to do something. You can't just go to church and think that that's good enough. And I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn anyone's faith. But, the, but our faith is a faith of action. It's a faith of doing. All right, Jesus did not die so that we could just feel good. He died so that we could do good as well. We need more action. Let the action of compassion define you as a person who belongs to Jesus. Get out there 
and show the compassion that we were shown by the Lord Jesus. So next, there's humility. Humility is the attitude that Jesus displayed where he gave up what was rightfully his for the sake of others, right? He showed us exactly what humility means by coming and submitting to the people and the rules of this world, even submitting to unjust, undignified, horrible death on the cross. He submitted to that. Humility is an attitude free from pride and self-assertion. Believe it or not, folks, humility is an attitude that you were meant to have. When we sinned in the garden, we lost our humility. Humility is something that we have been given the ability to have by Jesus Christ. <laughs> but we don't like it. All right, we don't like this one. I actually hate wearing dress shoes. That's why I chose humility and shoes to go together. We're nervous. When we're, when we're humble or when we're being challenged to be humble, we get nervous because we think we're not going to be heard. We're going to get walked all over. We won't get what we want. We're going to get left behind. I've got to stand up for myself. I've got to be self-assertive. <laughs> but that's not our God. Jesus wasn't like that. He was humble. <laughs> and then we'll say, yeah, and look how well that went. Jesus didn't, it didn't seem like to go that well. He didn't stand up for himself. He wound up getting crucified on the cross. But remember the next part of the story. Because of the humility that Jesus showed, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. God promises that if you humble yourself, you will be lifted up. Don't think less of yourself. Think of yourself less. God will take care of you. Put that item on. Humility is one of the things that Jesus freed us up to be. Because to be humble means to put our trust in God and not in ourselves to see how things go in our lives, especially our relationships. And then there's gentleness. Gentleness is an interesting one because it's not something we often think about and we don't really understand it very much. We think that gentle means, you know, kind of related to the way that we handle an egg or something like that. But it's, it's actually the quality of not being overly impressed with one's self-importance. That was a bit of a challenge for me when I read it in a commentary, so I'll read it again. The quality of not being overly impressed with one's self-importance. A gentle person is not impressed with who they are. They know who they are, and they know that there's nothing terribly special about that. This affects how they are and the way that they treat people. An excellent example of this is someone who you don't meet very often, but I get to talk with at least once a month. And his name is Bill Allen. He's the president of the AGC. I get to sit on the national board with him, and he's in charge of our whole association. And he's been in charge of mission organizations. He was a missionary for 30 years. He's currently working on his doctorate, and he's easily the most down-to-earth, best president that I've ever served with in the AGC. He doesn't care about being important. He couldn't care less. He knows the responsibilities that he has, but it doesn't really go to his head. He sits and talks about how terrible the Leafs are. He might be happy today. You know, he makes fun of my team. We sit at the same table. He's not isolated from us. He, he rubs shoulders and elbows with us. He is firm and not arrogant. He knows what he believes, and he is fearlessly steering our group of churches to be healthy and to be reproducing. Put the item of gentleness on. You, too, can be a gentle person. Treat people the way that you want to be treated. You're not better than them. You're a person just like them, and they need careful, gentle handling just like you, no matter who you are and no matter who they are. And then there's patience. Patience isn't just dealing with the kids when they're going off the walls 
or waiting in lines without grumbling. Usually when we wait in lines and we're thinking about patience, we're just going, be patient, be patient, be patient, right? That's not patience. That's just grumbling about being patient. Or sitting on a plane while you're waiting to take off for the third hour. With, <laughs> it's all those things, but it's a lot deeper. It's the capacity to bear injustice or injury without revenge or retaliation. Patience is the capacity to bear injustice or injury without revenge or retaliation. This is why Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek, to be patient in affliction, just as he was. We need to be patient. We need to put that item on, and we need to get used to wearing it, because Jesus promised that we would have trouble in this world, that this is not going to be easy Their only way to get through trouble and not lose our minds is to be patient, not moaning and wailing and wondering when it's going to be over. We need to take a long-suffering viewpoint. Christians won't get treated fairly. You, as a Christian, will not get treated fairly. Christians don't get their way all the time. And instead of getting angry and freaking out on the world and on people... We need to put on patience. The world is not an easy place to be a Christian. We need to be patient as we wait for the Lord to return and fight the good fight in the way that he told us to fight it. Okay, so that's the first five things. And there are three more, which usually get a little more airtime, which we focus on. But first, we need to make allowances, make allowance for each other's faults. As you all witnessed, there's no chance I need this belt. (laughs) But it's here, and it's a part of the ensemble. We need to make allowance for each other's faults. We're all different, uh, and we all have things about us which people find very irritating or annoying, like your pastor getting dressed on stage in front of all of you. That could be very irritating or annoying, and I I, I get it, kind of. I actually think this is genius. And if you don't like it, you can just bear with me. Make allowance for my faults. But, I, but Jesus used illustrations, and I think, it's, I think it's really great. I think the idea is great. I don't think I'm great, all right? There's the humility, all right? But it's true, right? We all have, we call them quirks if they're us. We call them annoyances if they're in other people. Um, we need to be patient, and we need to bear with one another. I preached on this a little while ago, and I want to be clear, just like I was last Sunday, that this does not include sin. Sin is never to be tolerated in a believer's life. And if you see sin working in a brother or sister's life, you owe it to them to confront them and to help them through it. That's our duty to our Christian brothers and sisters. But if a person has a tendency to be late or to be messy or is overly loud or overly dramatic or overly quiet or very chatty or not chatty at all, we need to be gracious with that person and bear with that person, making allowance for that person's faults. Because honestly, they may not be a fault. They're just a fault to you, right? Now, the last two items I believe are very, very important. All of these things are very important. But these last two, I think, are perhaps more important. That's just my opinion. That's not necessarily the Holy Spirit. But forgiveness is the first one. And forgiveness, as you all know, is very, very difficult. True forgiveness is very, very difficult. Ernest Hemingway once wrote a short story called The Capital of the World. And in that story, in the city of Madrid in Spain, there was a boy named Paco, right? And Paco and his father have a falling out. Paco is a 16-year-old boy. He knows a lot, a lot more than his father. And they had a falling out. And Paco ended up storming out of the house, saying he will never, ever come back, and that he hated his father. And the father realized that Paco meant what he said, and he wasn't coming back. And so he started to search for his son. He looked high and low for about five months. And he could not find his son. And so eventually he went to the Madrid newspaper and he took out a classified that's an ad in the back. And in that classified, he just wrote a few words. He said, Dear Paco, 
Meet me at the Hotel Montagna at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. I love you, Papa. And the man placed the ad, said a prayer, and went to bed. And on Tuesday, 800 Pacos showed up. (laughs) And every one of those boys was looking for forgiveness and love from their father. Forgiveness and unforgiveness are huge in a church and they're huge in this church. Without forgiveness, you would not have this new set of clothes available to put on. Jesus died to save you. Jesus died to provide these clothes for you. That's what this cross is, is symbolizing behind me. The forgiveness and love of Jesus for you. You deserve to die for your sin. And Jesus died for you instead. I deserve to die for what I've done that was evil and wrong and shameful. And Jesus said, no, I will stand in Phil's spot. I will take the punishment instead of him. And so Jesus, the child of God, died for Phil, the sinful man. And honestly, as I thought about that, and I think about forgiveness a lot, I want you to understand that you have been forgiven for causing the death of a child. And I think that that's one of the worst things that I could possibly be held responsible for, the death of a child. And that is what I'm responsible for. I'm responsible for the death of the innocent child of God whose name was Jesus. He forgave me for that. And he forgave you for that. So the question is then, can you forgive others when they sin against you? Can you forgive someone for what they did behind your back? Can you forgive the words that they spoke against you? Can you forgive the money that they took from you? Can you forgive the lies that they told about you? Can you forgive the way that they cheated you? Can you forgive their treatment of you? Can you forgive the treatment that they did to your loved one? If you're a Christian, you must forgive as the Lord forgave you. Unforgiveness is like stage four cancer. It's pretty much always deadly. Unforgiveness in the church is like stage four cancer in your body. Something is going to die. And it's my guess that many, if not all of us, have a relationship with a Christian brother or sister that is a little bit or maybe a lot awkward and full of emotion because unforgiveness is in that relationship. We must forgive as the Lord forgave us. It's not fair for us to accept the forgiveness of us killing God's son and not pay that forgiveness to other people because we took the forgiveness of Jesus. We must give the forgiveness of Jesus out. I am begging you to do whatever you can to forgive those people in your life that you need to forgive. I'm begging you to ask forgiveness of the people that you have hurt because if you keep unforgiveness in your life, it is like drinking poison and expecting your enemy to die. This is one of the, that's why I picked the tie, by the way, because this is one of the toughest pieces of clothing that a man has to put on. And I kid you not, this tie has been tied for 17 years. (laughs) This is my wedding tie. And Howard Hurd, Tied it for me on the day, of my, uh, the day before my wedding. I went up to him and I said, Howard, you've tied my ties for six years. I need you to tie one more. And he did. And it's still going. But it's hard. Forgiveness is hard. And it costs something. It means we pay for the hurt that was done to us. Just as Jesus paid for the sin you committed against him. This is easily one of the hardest things that Jesus asks of you. And you must do it, and so must I. And finally, over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This is the final and most important part of the clothes, the thing that pulls it all together. John 15 says that if we're going to love one another as Jesus loved us, that's what we need to do. We read the same thing in John 13. As Jesus has loved us, so we need to love one another. 
And Jesus said that, hey, Sam, do you have a question? All right. Oh, Jesus did not provide those for me today. Just the suit. But I appreciate that you noticed. You know, like Jesus said that love is the thing that is going to show us off more than anything to the world. That it's not how snappy your clothes look on Sunday. It's nothing to do with that. It's nothing to do with how eloquent the words that come out of your mouth are. It has to do with, do you love one another as I have loved you? That is going to show Jesus to the world more than any sermon illustration or big group of people. It's, do you love one another? He said, greater love has no one, no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And then Jesus did that. And so that's what we are called to do, to lay down our lives for one another. We need to love one another as Jesus loved us. I think I've got it together here now. <laughs> Just feels off. Thanks, thanks. That's what I'm going for. The Jesus commands us to bear fruit. And this long-lasting fruit that we need to bear is all based on love. Every single thing that Jesus wants us to produce is based on love. And I want you to know that this love is the love that Jesus had when he died for you. And now we have been set free to pour that love out on other people. And it's not just our duty to do that. It's our privilege to do that. You may not want to. You may not feel comfortable with this level of love, either giving or receiving it from another human being that's not your spouse or your parents, but you must allow it to change your life from what it was to what it is. And you need to be willing to take that love that Jesus poured out on you and pour it out on other people. We accepted it. We took it from Jesus. Now we must give it. And the more that we give it, the more that we have. And it's a continual waterfall of love that can come from the Lord into you and out onto other people. That's huge. First John says that Jesus' love is brought to completion through your love for others. You complete the work of God. You have the privilege of showing other people just how real God is. And we do that by putting on love, which binds all of these other pieces of clothing together in unity. That's huge. So let's come back to the beginning. The unfair assumptions that people make about us because of our faith. I think that much is assumed about Christians because much of our faith in the past, and maybe the way that we've attacked or trying to live in the world, much of Christianity has been known for what we stand against as opposed to what we stand for. We need to be known much more for what we stand for and the kind of people that we are. Jesus stood against all the sin in the world. And Jesus had no problem talking about hell and about punishment at all. He didn't shy away from those things and neither will I. He often preached against sin. But people still came and flocked to him because even louder than his stand against sin was the person that he was. A person who was compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, patient. Jesus made allowances for the faults of others. He forgave everyone who offended him. He forgave us and above all, he loved us. We are his people now. Fix your eyes on Jesus and love and forgive as he did. Let's make sure that people know that about us and that we couldn't care less about all the stuff we can't do because of the amazing, full, rich, satisfying life that he's freed us up to live. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day and thank you for these people who are so patient with their pastor. Lord, I thank you for the, the great pictures that we get from the scriptures. And I thank you that we can picture running races, putting on clothes, and, and working hard for you, Lord. That's what you've called us to do, to live a fruitful life of hard work in you. Thank you for freeing us up to do that. And Lord, I pray that we would live deeply into that. In Jesus' name, amen.